Hello, my name is David Hillier and I will be giving a short video on international corporate governance. This video is based on my book Corporate Finance and I will be covering sections 2.5 and 2.6 in this video. Predominantly I'll be looking at section 2.5. Now I do have a set of slides but I'm not going to be covering them um, in detail and following them uh, word by word. I'll just be giving you some of my ideas and views on international corporate governance. They may be valid, they may not be valid. Uh, I do research in this area and um, I've got some insights into some of my own work uh, on corporate governance. I also do a lot of teaching um, overseas. I've taught in the Middle East, in Oman. Um, I've taught in Southeast Asia, in Africa, all over Europe, UK. You know, I, I have got a lot of experience of different systems and that has informed my views of corporate governance. Ultimately, I believe that corporate governance is about culture. That cultures determine uh, the way in which managers see themselves within an organisation. I can you can go back th hundreds of years and say, well, it's possible that religion even has influenced or flavoured the way in which corporations see themselves. And this is, you know, this is beyond the scope of uh, this video, but it is an area that I think is is worthy of attention and, and further um, further research. For now, I will be just talking about corporate organisations within the international environment and looking, giving a summary of the ways in which this environment can impact upon corporate structures. Now, you might think, well, why have I put corporate governance in as chapter two in uh, a corporate finance book? The The reason I did, I've done that is because I, I believe that the incentives of managers will determine their decisions will definitely affect their decision making. So if I am a manager of a family firm, my decisions will likely be driven by factors that are distinct from managers who are employed by a widely held company or are employed by state shareholders, that is the government. So I've put this right in here right at the very beginning because I think it's important that organisational structures are understood for us to really understand how managers make decisions, which is the the real blood of the corporate finance textbook. Now, the four main areas that are covered in section 2.5 of corporate finance are, are these ones. Uh, I'll just take you through these uh, quickly. Uh, so first of all, we're going to look at legal systems. And, and legal systems are really, they, they've been divided into, in, in my uh, diagram, which is figure 2.5 of the book, divided into three main areas. Uh, first of all, we have common law systems. In, in common law environments, the law is determined by decisions that take place within courts. So if a judge decides to change a law, then the law will then change. And so because courts are meeting all the time continuously, you see more flexibility in response of the, the legal regime to new events. Because if I am a creditor of a company and I'm not happy, say, with a, a certain thing that was done, I would take a company to court, a judge would make a decision, that decision would change law 
And so you have a very responsive system in common law societies. Civil law refers to those regimes where the law is enshrined in a code. So continental Europe, Europe has the Roman code, the Roman civil code. You also have civil law systems in Scandinavia, China, uh, Turkey, and in Japan. And then the third area is uh, in terms of religious law. And at the moment, it's Sharia law, uh, which is uh, growing and you know embedded in a number of areas. And specifically, you see that I've got Iran, Libya, and Saudi Arabia there as complete religious law societies. And, and when I talk about, you know, th this area, I'm really talking about it in terms of corporations. Not personal law, but, uh, you know, actually corporate law. You, can, you don't, you can't just categorise countries into three areas. You, you do get countries where you have an overlap or a hybrid system. So, for example, in Scotland, um, where I come from, you have a combination of civil law and common law um, in terms of the way in which the, the country is uh, governed. And that is similar to, say, South Africa and Thailand. And then you can take you know, a hybrid of common law and religious law, and you see that in Malaysia, Nigeria, Pakistan, India, Qatar. And then you've got the civil law, religious law societies, which is you see in the, the Gulf region and uh, the Middle East. How do we define these three different systems then? Well, I've spoken about common law. It's been it's found to be responsive uh, to events, um, tends to be more shareholder friendly. Civil law, because the law is enshrined in a code on parliament, you, it's difficult to change the law. You can change it, but it takes time. So civil law societies are less flexible and less responsive to events. And religious law, well, religious law doesn't change because it's based on um, religion. And in Islam, it's based on uh, Sharia law. So... You know, I've got these slides, um, and, you know, you you can go into this in more detail in the book, but one thing I want to emphasise is that just because you're regulated, it doesn't mean to say that the, the regulation is enforced. There are a number of countries that are heavily regulated, but arguably enforcement is poor. You know, I could use a number of countries, but I'm not going to, to say them. But if you, you can read in the book and you can uh, get information on that. But there is that difference. So, you know, strong regulation, weak enforcement, that's the worst case because strong regulation just translates into bureaucracy. And if you've got bureaucracy with very little adherence to, to rules, you just have a, a very inefficient system. So a question in uh, international governance is, um, to what extent do we see this enforcement? The best system is where you have good regulation and good enforcement. And that tends to be you know, viewed in, say, Scandinavian region, uh, the US, um, the UK, to a less extent, Northern Europe. Southern Europe, its uh, enforcement tends to be weaker. So when we, we think about this, think about these two areas, you know, how efficient is the, the legal system and, you know, and do we see a lot of compliance to the legal system? We then move on to what we call bank and market-based systems. So you've got the law. You know, but then you also have the way in which uh, companies are funded. So are companies funded by the banks or are they funded predominantly by the market? Do you see banks heavily involved in companies? Do you see uh, an external disciplinary market from the, the trading of uh, shares in, 
in stock markets. Examples of bank-based systems where banks are very strong are Germany and Japan. And, you know, good examples of market-based systems are the US and the UK. Now, there is a, a nice table. It's table uh, 2.7 in the textbook, and I've reproduced it here. Uh, it's a World Bank paper um, by these uh, two author authors who have actually done a lot of fantastic work in this area. And if you're interested in looking into this in detail, then I would strongly encourage you to do a Google search on, on these two authors. It really, really is good quality stuff. But what we're doing here and what... Now, I, I, this isn't directly from their, their paper. I've taken a ratio uh, of like the domestic bank deposits, that's how important the banking sector is, and divided it by stock market capitalisation. So the those countries that have a low value, you would say, are predominantly market-based. Well, I would say that. Those val uh, countries that are high value, you would say they were uh, bank-based. It's a it's a proxy measure. It, it's not a great measure. Uh, you can see here, you can see here that countries that were, you know, you would traditionally view to be bank based. Germany, for example, are, are to the right, and countries that are market based, like the UK, are to the left. So you know, it's okay, but it does give you a, a, an insight into the range of, I suppose, systems uh, that. Uh, prevail in the world. Now, you know, before I go on to ownership structure, um, which is the next part, um, I want to talk about just bank-based systems and market-based systems and the benefits and the strengths of those. A bank-based system, you have a very strong investor, very knowledgeable, active, involved investor. You know, being part of company decision making, so the banks have a long term relationship with companies in the banking bank based systems, and there's an informal information flow that goes between these uh, the banks and uh, companies. In market based systems, because you have a lot of external independent investors, there information quality has to be better because you you have to provide good quality information to investors. So you see differences in the characteristics of information quality in these in these systems. Now the next area which is ownership structure is to do with really the, the difference between widely held firms and closely held firms. This is directly tied into agency theory which I covered in an earlier video. Widely held firms that you see, and you see this in the UK and in the US to a lesser extent, you have a separation between ownership, that's the stockholders, and control, and that's the managers. Because there's no one dominant shareholder, the managers have an awful lot of power. And we say there's an agency relationship between the managers and the shareholders, a type one agency relationship. How do investors engage with companies well because investors don't have a lot of power because they don't have a large proportion of shares they will just sell their their equity if they're not happy so you see this as an inv exit investment strategy in closely held firms you have a dominant shareholder or shareholders maybe one or two shareholders and the big agency relationship there is between controlling the large shareholders and non-controlling that's the minority shareholders how do the large shareholders get involved with the company? Through engagement. And that engagement is easier because you own all the shares, so you can control the management. And we call that a voice investment strategy. You can go into these areas in a lot more detail in a corporate governance class. Uh, but for now, it's important just to know about these. And finally, this this last area, which is the market for corporate control, um, I'm not going to talk about that in a lot of detail. Why? Because the market for corporate control has really just been found to be valid in the US. What does it mean? Well, if a manager performs poorly, a company or investor will come in. The market is efficient, so share prices will be low uh, because the managers are, are performing poorly. That means it's easier for an external party to buy those securities, those equities up, 
and take over the, the company. And that's the, the external control mark, takeover market. Those manage, managers who have performed poorly will be effectively sacked by the new, the new owners. And so therefore managers are incentivized to perform well. And we say that's the market for corporate control. You know, it's common in the US, and I think it's effective in the US. Recent research that I've read has suggested that in the UK and, and elsewhere, although you might have a takeover, the managers don't actually lose their jobs, or a lot of managers don't lose their jobs. So it, it puts some doubt into this idea that um, the market for corporate control is something which is efficient. I do think it applies to the US, because of the size of the market, but I'm less convinced that it applies to, say, the UK. Also, it's not very common, you know, hostile takeovers, which is what, what we call these things when an, an external investor buys the shares of a company in, you know, against the wishes of the management. Um, they're not very common in Europe, but they are becoming more common, especially with involvement of hedge funds and activist investors. Okay, so some differences, um, what I would say is, is that, you know, you've got these bullet points here, but I believe that it's, a lot of this is down to culture, and culture will influence the governance structures within any one environment. We can go into the characteristics of these, uh, and I've done research in this area, so I'm not criticising that work, and I do think that research in this area provides a lot of insight but that nebulous concept of culture, I think, um, is an umbrella uh, over all of this. Now, section 2.6 is it's just a, a little descriptive section that just uh, covers the lifetime of a company. Um, when I teach this class, I usually get my students to, to do this for themselves and choose their own company. Um, and uh, that... That, that does provide a lot of insights and also gives students a, an idea of how finance uh, and governance just permeates the whole life of a, a company. So, thank you very much for listening. Uh, that I've really covered all of Chapter 2 now in terms of my videos, so future videos I'll go on and talk about Chapter 3, and that is about financial statement analysis. Cheerio.